Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm Scott, and I'm here to talk about support. Um, it's great here. It's great to be here in Prague. Um, I haven't been to Europe in a long time, so it's nice to be back. I am sort of irritated because I spent about three months memorizing this session in Czech, and I've been here for two days now, and everyone's speaking English, so. I think maybe next time we should make that a little bit more clear. Unless you want to hear the Czech version, it's about four hours long. Okay. Dobre den. Okay. Wait, that's not right. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, cool. So let me just uh, start off with the obligatory. My name is Scott Massey. I work for Pantheon. I'm the director of customer success. And that is basically uh, support, it's onboarding. It's uh, uh, any of the stuff that we do to help people be successful on our platform. So that's training sometimes, that's uh, doing a lot of screencasts and, and telling people how to uh, develop on our platform and be successful. Um, before that, I worked at Promet, which was a Drupal shop in Chicago. Uh, I built their support team. Um, and before that, I worked in IT managed services, which is basically supporting uh, Cisco, Citrix, Microsoft stuff. Um, for a shop in, for a uh, IT company in Chicago. Um, my, uh, yeah, so there's my Twitter stuff. And I wanted to share something that I've never told another human being. Um, these are three things that I've left in my uh, search browser when I was doing uh, training sessions for people on Pantheon. Um, so hopefully uh, when you guys come up and ask questions, you can share something that you've never told another human being. Um, I don't remember why I was looking up Chinese dog doesn't want a bath, but I think it was probably a YouTube video for my wife. So here's what we're going to talk about. We'll talk about uh, why people think uh, support is a drag. Uh, we'll talk about building sustainable support products. Um, uh, I have some case studies that I kind of want to run through uh, to sort of give you uh, some real world examples of, of how to structure support that I think is good. Uh, the tools, uh, how to hire people for support, and just a little bit of sort of philosophy and hand-waving. Um, I've done this uh, before for people uh, at different uh, Drupal cons and that kind of thing. And so just before we start, like, how many of you work for like a dev shop or something that offers Drupal support? How many um, are looking to maybe add support? How many are uh, end users who are looking for support? <laughs> There's three guys right in the front here. So, um, so uh, that's about the usual demographics. So this is sort of geared towards people who have it, who struggle, and I've been definitely experienced a lot of the things, and maybe we can sort of share our experiences and, uh, and get a little bit better at it. Um, so why offer support? Uh, I think there's a lot of reasons that uh, people sort of fall into that role. Um, maybe because uh, you know they built a site for someone, or they've took, taken over a site for uh, another dev shop, or something like that. Um, but uh, the real reason that we do it is um, why we offer support. I think is has a lot to do with credibility, and especially if it's sites that we've built, it has a lot to do with. Um, with putting our money where our mouth is uh, in terms of the technical debt we incur when we build the site and being able to offer the end user uh, the, uh, the promise of like long-term support. So it's definitely more of a marriage than a fling and I think you sort of have to think of it like that. Um, I also think that uh, the, the benefit of doing it is, well, there's several benefits, but the one thing, you know, above the fact that it's like a fixed, uh, fixed income, you know, instead of just doing projects. Uh, in addition to that, it moves you up the ladder of trust, so to speak, uh, and from like a vendor to an advisor towards actually kind of a stakeholder in the client's um, process and decision-making process. Um, you know, before, before I started working for Pantheon, there was, you know, and not all of our clients were like this, but there were a couple clients that um, we would meet with them annually and help them figure out their budget for the next year for their IT expenditures. And like to me, that's uh, a good place to be because it just, uh, you know, it, it indicates the trust that they have in you. 
and it also kind of indicates that you're the de facto person they're going to go to when they make choice or the de facto shop they're going to go to when they make choices about who they're going to get to build their site or uh, who they're going to go to. So I think it's important to not just offer it um, because if you offer support poorly or begrudgingly, uh, I think it causes pain on all levels and it doesn't really secure you or move you up that sort of ladder of trust. Um, so I think the first key to doing support well is, is uh, understanding that what you're doing is you're building these products and you're offering service products. And so there's products and then there's not really good products. And so an anti-product is kind of like the column on the left where uh, hey, just call us when anything happens or if something goes wrong and we'll help you fix it. Or uh, we built your site and then say, you know, you get a phone call and it's like, hey, you know, you built us that feeds integration and originally it was for Twitter, but now we're, um, you know, we're downloading uh, Chinese newspapers and it's not working, so that's a bug and you need to fix it. Um, you know, or if you're accepting new projects from people and you get a call that, hey, I'm a Drupal developer and I have this uh, site that I'm building for the Czech government and it's overdue by a month and there's like five things that I don't know how to do, so I need you to help me fix it ASAP. Like, I think those are sort of recipes for failure and I think when you build kind of your product line of support services, uh, it's a good litmus test to kind of see what if things fit into the, that product list, those are your strengths, and if they don't, then they might not be good things to take, like you might not win with them. So um, what I want to talk about is kind of how to build these successful products, you know, for example, support development. Um, like when it's a product, that means you can attach parameters to it, you can, um, you know, you spell it out for sales, what the limitations are, what you cover, what you don't cover, you specify the billing rates, and if a product is successful, with just changing a minimal number of parameters, you should be able to use it over and over. You know, so if you sell block hour agreements, you know, you should be able to just say 50 hours or 100 hours, you know, at 100 hours, the hourly rate, rate drops by, you know, a certain amount. But essentially, it's the same kind of thing. Um, you know, there's been examples when I, when I worked at ProMed in Chicago, we had a client that had already built a site on, on D7 and they wanted to continue working with the dev shop that they had, but the dev shop used SVN, SVN sort of in a half-assed manner, and they wanted to use Git. They knew they needed to move to Git. These guys weren't gonna, weren't gonna migrate to Git at that point in time. So they hired us to basically just be their release management, and we set up a schedule where we pushed things, you know, where if we saw anything that had been committed to the repo, we managed the repo, we would push it to dev, we worked out the QA um, workflow, to where you know, we would let them know we pushed things and they would check on it and then we would push it to live and so forth. If anything went wrong, we would revert it and that's kind of all we did. And it was kind of cool because um, it sort of put us in that, that loop of trust you know, where if they needed decisions, they kind of knew who to come to uh, for a second opinion and eventually we sort of became more of the de facto go-to. So I think like creating uh, products that you can support and sustain um, is beneficial, even if they're not just your typical kind of Drupal support. Um, and additionally, like another one is doing updates for people. Like just doing updates by itself may not seem like of much value, but it is for a lot of people who may just need something, uh, who are happy to manage their own site, or uh, you know, just need to take care of the minimum basics. And so what I want to do is some case studies of these three um, fictional people and how they made support work for them. So the first one is this girl, Aria, and she's a site builder. She knows a little bit of PHP. Uh, she's mainly built you know, a few sites for people, for friends, for family, that kind of thing. And so her issue is, is that as a freelancer, she has a lot of stuff on her plate. You know, she has to do her own marketing, she has to look for new clients, she actually has to build the site. Um, but in addition to that, the uh, existing clients, say 10 of them a month, are calling her to ask questions, and then maybe, you know, 10 customers are calling her for five hours a day, or five hours a month, and maybe she's doing three hours of billable work from that. And so, 
you add that all together, that's about a week's worth of work. Like 25% of her month is doing um, work that's not really well organized. It's not bringing her in new business. It's just sort of upkeep on existing sites. So a use case for her, she goes to meet with her um, you know, support consultant and this uh, person, they set a, a strategy and the target is like existing clients, the clients she's, she already has on our platform and the objective is to monetize the free and kind of piecemeal work that she's been doing for the, for the people. So the change in messaging is like prior when we were talking about like, well, you built this and now it's a bug. The messaging that has to start like really high, you know, in the discovery period is like, you know, Drupal is this great way to build sites, but keep in mind your site is a custom site. It uses custom code. Even if it's contrib modules, you know, this is a custom configuration. Bugs occur. Making sure your client, you know, your end user is really well educated on what they're getting, the benefits of using Drupal, of which there are many, but the fact that bugs exist in life, they're suffering. We will figure out a way to address these things and it'll get worked out because I know what I'm doing and this is how I do it with my support products. Um, and I think it's also really, uh, you know, rather than wait for the first month's invoice to go where you've built for the time that you've spent talking or not billing for it all, it's good to say, um, you know, as we build these support products, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up this ticketing system. So after we, after we launch, there's gonna be a ticketing system uh, if we talk on the phone about it, it's gonna be billable. If you give me a really complete, concise ticket of what's going on, how to replicate the problem, that's not billable and that will save you money and it'll save me time and we can be much further along in the process of actually debugging the problem rather than uh, conversing about it, which, which is real hard to do, plus it's billable for you, end user. So you create these products where you say, okay, I'm gonna give you a block of hours a month you know, I know over the last few months, we've probably talked about five hours a month. So let's just start out with five block hours recurring each month and you use them or you lose them, but we can kind of knock out these things rather than piecemeal. We, you tell me how you want that five hours spent or we can save it for emergencies or that kind of thing. And um, then you set up a second one that's just monitoring. Okay, here's monitoring. And uh, you know, on the back end, I set up my Pingdom account I set up my PagerDuty account and I find a good host. Um, I know of a really good one, by the way, if you want to talk about it. Um, and we, uh, you have something on the back end to kind of support this, this product that basically just says, you know, I'm not a sysadmin. We picked a host. They, they'll support the platform, but I'll be, your, I'll be the point of contact. So if something goes wrong, it'll wake me up, but I can get on the phone and manage it and make sure that it's done. Um, and then the final product that I would offer you as an end user is like your managed updates because there's security, there's core updates. Um, and so what I'd like to do is, you know, the way, that, the way that I do it is when security updates come out, we do it in a week. We come up with a QA workflow flow plan where either you have a couple days to go through it or uh, you let me QA it. I create my Selenium tests for X amount of dollars or euros up front. And, um, and that's how we handle updates. And then if, for ex and then so we do security updates that week, contrib updates, we do quarterly. Let's set something like that. You work that out at the beginning. And then um, in the event that, that you push a contrib update and it breaks something, um, hopefully you've built a great site and there's no, you know, that might not ever happen, but su suppose it does, you can either revert it or you can use the block hours to fix it because that's the nature. Sometimes bugs happen and I can't, you know, I wanna be successful, I wanna be around forever, I wanna support you forever, I need to make money on this as I go. So, so she does all this stuff, she listens to her support consultant which doesn't really exist as a role but she does that and she comes up with these numbers, you know, just 500 units of currency for five hours a month and then just a low price for the monitoring plan because it's just monitoring. It's, it's waking up possibly in the middle of the night, but you know, the, host, the host will hopefully be handling any issues. And then the updates, which would be you know, $200 a month to handle all the updates. And so what we have is like the $500 is a block hour agreement, a monthly recurring block hour agreement. The 50 is managed services in, from like the managed service world. It's flat $50. 
and then the updates are a flat $50 and, or a flat $200. And so what that does, it sort of puts the risk on you and puts the onus on you as the developer to be able to make that profitable. But if you, um, like if you amortize that over a year, as long as you're uh, doing less than 24 hours worth of work, you know, you're roughly making your margin. So, um, you know, hopefully, again, I found that this works because core updates shouldn't break anything. Um, contrib updates might, but you're doing it quarterly, so you can kind of, you know, give them the option to hold off or, you know, it's not gonna add a new feature so we can wait on it, but security and core gets done. So that's an example for her. And so we're looking at, instead of, you know, roughly 400 based on what's billable, you know, the end result for, you bundle it all these different agreements together into a managed service agreement and they pay 750 a month. So the next example is like in America, you have, to, you have to attach like a number to your dev shop in order to make it real. So I made this one Hodor 9. And so this is a dev shop in America that's been around a while and they put a out a lot of sites and um, you know, they're pretty well established. Uh, the problem is, is they've been offering support for a while and it's really disorganized. Um, project managers are managing support as well. They hate it. Um, devs are getting pulled off of projects to work on support issues for really difficult problems. Um, you know, everyone's getting burnt out. The, the devs don't want to work on support because they're really good and they can, you know, they have a list of uh, places they could, they could be working and maybe they don't want to be doing support. They want to work on fun projects, not picking up the phone whenever there's a fire because trust me, no one ever calls support because things are going swimmingly and they just want to say hi. So, so that's the problem. So the strategy, we've already sort of talked about existing customers. Now let's just focus on like new clients. So these are the new people that come in and they're looking for support. And generally, um, and so the goal is to make it sustainable. And so like the risk is, is you get the call and this is, this is a support client that I've handled before where it's like, hey, so you do support, right? I Googled support and Drupal and your name came up. So that's great. Uh, I have this D6 site. It's actually our intranet and it's actually running on WAMP on a, on a uh, Windows NT server. And so uh, if you want to do any work, I'll give you a dongle so you can VPN to a dev site and do the work there and then we'll push the changes together. And so that is enough to make like your developer just you know post his resume and say thanks, but I'm not gonna work on this. And so um, the message that you want to convey now is like, that's awesome, but we work on supportable working sites and that may not be one. Now, that's kind of an extreme example, but you may get someone that just comes in. A more typical example is like someone who comes in with a laundry list of like, hey, you do support, that's great. I need a dozen things done, here they are. And so it sounds simple, but the issue that you run into is, you know, you say, sure, we'll do it. And then you look at the site and you see like um, panels, display suite, contexts, um, and like, uh, eight other things that kind of do the same thing and some are enabled and there's like one panel that's active across the whole site and you know there's you know you you sort of are like shit what have I done you know and so um, so the model for handling this that I have found to be successful is um, you say sure we're happy to look at the site what we do is we have a site audit and from there we go through onboarding and from there, we, uh, you know, once we get things into a uh, supportable state, then we start working on the issues. And so some people will balk at that. And um, I think it's important for the success of your developers and the long-term success of your company to know when to say no. You know, there's like the, um, the Groucho Marx line about, you know, I don't wanna be part of any club that would have me as a member. And so it's the same kind of thing. Like when someone's looking for support, it's almost like an indicator in itself. Like maybe they were fired by their, you know, especially if someone came, comes up to you and say, yeah, our devs were really assholes at the last place, you know, so, um, you know, we, we know that you're good, so we know you're, you'll fix it. And especially if you know the devs, it's a small community. So a lot of times 
it turns out that they might be a difficult uh, client to handle or they had some sort of weird use case that, that um, is difficult to solve. So you have this site audit that you've developed. And so yesterday, I, there was a pretty good session on site audits. Uh, there's many different places where you should be able to piece one together pretty quickly if you don't have one. Who has a site audit that they do? So um, really, with, with me, I've tried a couple different times. Uh, the one that we use now at Pantheon is actually pretty good. Uh, and it's available, like anyone can use it. It's a bunch of Drush commands that we created, and it, it's just a project called site underscore audit, and it's a bunch of Drush commands. It's sort of Pantheon-centric for like our enterprise stuff, so it tests to see if caching is working, and it, to me, like a lot of uh, the site audits, like you can spend a lot of time digging into like Hacked and Coder and things like that, which are all useful, um, all really useful. Uh, I, I also think that there's a lot of things that are uh, really closely correlated with a problematic site, you know, the number of modules that are enabled, things like that. And so like the thing that we built kind of checks for that, but also uh, the DrupalCon uh, Portland uh, session that we did, uh, we two uh, women, one from Chapter 3 and one from ProMed in Chicago, all go into detail on their site audit and what they check for, you know, like, uh, PHP and fields and things like that to sort of give a feel for like how difficult it's going to manage or you know if somehow you know they make a small change what it might affect across the whole site. So design this site audit. Hopefully you can execute it within a few hours. I don't know depending on the custom stuff like the, the guy yesterday was saying sometimes it can take up to 30 days but execute it quickly and bill for it. You know, say, because what you're going to give them, like the one that we have, um, it uses like the Twitter bootstrap, so it actually generates like that report there. You can use it from the command line, but it also gives some a nice deliverable that you can say, hey, you may not know much about your site, but after this, you'll know a little bit more, and it's going to be $3,200. And that's what we charged, and it covers your time and um, the resources that you put into doing it. So you develop this site audit, and if it passes, then you just, you say, that's great. Let's have an onboarding call. Let's have a kickoff call. Let's talk about what we need to fix. Um, if it doesn't pass, then you say, okay, so here's, here's how we handle support. Now that we see that there's bigger problems that we need to fix to make your site supportable, um, we, set, we think we can do it, you know, in an agile fashion with 50 hours. And so let's start out, let's take these 50 hours, let's get the site to where we know it's going to, last and we can start doing the work you want. Some will say no, you know, it's up to you to kind of make the call if you want to bypass that. I would say no. Like I, I think that there's, I have found, at least in my neighborhood, there's a lot of people looking for support and if you build a roster of supportable sites, it makes life much easier for you and your developer. So uh, for an example, kind of to project the revenue here, they do this one-time site audit and they charge 3,200 clams for it, and then there's a problem, and they fix it over 50 hours. You know, so it ends up costing a little. It ends up costing more than they thought they wanted it to cost, and then they say, "Okay, so now that we're done with that, let's set up a monthly recurring plan similar to what we talked about with Aria, where we do updates and we do monitoring. Only this time there's an SLA where we actually guarantee that someone's going to get to you within." two hours or four hours, and you would base that on the amount of time it's going to take for one person to not get the call and then the next person hopefully to get it. And then you add some padding and you come up with a number that you feel that you can live with and offer. And you tack on an SLA to that and you bill a little bit more for it. And then you come up, you know, say that they don't want to do a monthly recurring use or lose kind of uh, hourly commitment. Then they just buy 200 block hours. You do it at a slightly higher rate because they're not doing monthly recurring. Like monthly recurring is the best for a dev shop. If they're not going to go for that, that's fine. It's just a little bit higher. And then, you know, there's sort of an example of what your total annual revenue is for that client. And then the last one, which is just sort of like a kind of a thought experiment, is um, this guy Joffrey, and he knows nothing about coding or site building. What he does know is about uh, how to speak English good. And um, he also is a, uh, you know, he graduated with an English degree, which 
um, in America, they say is like the most useless degree to have. And so this guy, he really, the problem is that he can't pay his rent and the bills for, you know, the seven kingdoms that he also happens to be king of. So his strategy uh, is to target other dev shops, um, other C-level uh, people who have blogs, and he's going to create a product that delivers content management. Because in my experience, I had several clients who were not computer savvy and struggled with WYSIWYG and really needed someone to do that. And um, there are people out there that do this pretty successfully. And it's something that a lot of dev shops don't think about offering. It's like, um, we don't want to offer content management. We'd rather not even offer support. But, you know, we definitely don't want to be editing content for people. But there's also a way to do it where if you, you know, you teach someone how to use WYSIWYG, you teach them how to, you know, create a Google Analytics report that sort of shows what happened to content for the month. You give them like a QA workflow and you say, um, this is, you know, you send me the ideas, I'll clean it up, it's going to come back to you. I'm going to, you know, download an image from Shutterstock that I think is kind of appropriate, stick it in there. We'll do five a month and we'll bill 500 bucks a month for it to make sure your content is updated. We kind of ride you and PM you a little bit to make sure that content on your site is always updated. And so this is, you know, maybe not, depending on what your payroll expenses are, this might be pretty close to the same margins you might be able to make based on, you know, how, you know, the rate that you can hire people at. So, you know, it's just sort of a thought. So, what am I doing on time here? Okay, three more hours. So, project mind and support mind. Um, so the, the, the important thing to think of is the biggest thing that I've noticed working with other dev shops is the usual approach is trying to approach support as if it's a project. And you get really good at agile or waterfall, and then you get to support, and it all goes crazy because it's all these various issues that come up and then go away and disappear, and then 10 issues completely unrelated to come up, and then the third one is a really difficult problem that ends up taking 40 days, and then the, you know, the, the developer has to try and estimate on a site that he's never seen before or maybe hasn't touched in months. And so um, that's where a lot of those things get go haywire and that's why having kind of these processes in place is really important. So you build these processes, um, you know, because generally what comes up, you have problems, like my site is doing something weird. You know, you have incidences, my site just went away. You have requests, like I'd like my site to do this. And then you have change management, like it's time to go from D6 to D7 or whatever. And so like those categories are sort of a good framework for how you build your products and how you sort of respond to kind of emergency situations. And so um, the way to think about support is not projects, but what helps me is kind of a standard in case model. So standards are re repeatable processes. Um, like if, if my wife, if I come home from work and my wife says, let's go out, to eat, um, that means I say, okay, and I change my clothes and we go out to eat. That doesn't mean like I debate it or I complain about it or I mention that I just went out to eat the night before because I know my life is much better if we just go out to eat. That's like a standard. I don't care if I went out the last seven nights, we're going out to eat again tonight, easy. You know, that's how you build like a standard. But see, I'd say that accounts for maybe 25% of Drupal support rate related issues. Um, most of them are cases, so you treat them as case management. And that's where you need like investigative skills, you need to do some troubleshooting, you, need, you can gradually build the standards of the tasks that need to be done. And the goal is to make as much as possible stand, uh, standards rather than cases, so then the difficult stuff at the very least, if you have like a level one and level two support person, level one can look at it and say, I don't know the answer, but I do know that I'm supposed to get log files, I'm supposed to check this, this, and this, and then I'm supposed to summarize and give level two a replicatable way to reproduce the error. So you have your level one person, which may be at a lower pay level or lower experience, at least they know how to build um, build it up and summarize it and give them like a neat gift wrap package for the level two person. Um, more of like the problems, incidents, all that cool stuff about like service delivery framework is all available via ITIL, like 
which, which has existed for a while. Like support is actually pretty well defined, maybe as much as project management is. It's just that it tends to be like on the enterprise IT managed services world. But you can, it's very completely dry, boring reading, but it has a lot of cool stuff for building support projects. And then, so, like my onboarding thing um, is really important because this is where we get into really what matters with support almost as much as technical chops is the soft skills and the ability to um, quickly kind of build a process where people are familiar with how you do it. So you have this onboarding call, you know, say that like we talk about, you know, they've done the site audit and they're ready to go. You have an onboarding call and this is what you go over. You go over the processes they need to know immediately, like how to create a ticket, how to create an emergency ticket, how to call me, how, like what a ticket needs to have in it for us to get right to work on it, um, uh, what hours were available for support, how to reach us, that kind of thing. Then you cover all the questions, you take all the questions that people have asked you over the last 10 months and you compress them all into a 30 minute call where you answer all those questions that keep coming up. So you, you theoretically kind of answer the first two standard deviations of questions and then you do it like the most important thing, the, the weirdest thing is um, people actually like to see my face when we do this call. So doing it on the phone is nowhere near as effective in the long run as um, doing it in a go-to meeting or WebEx or something where you're connecting and you're seeing like this is a human being. So before they start, you know, the sort of the email furious typing at a nameless face, they know that we've talked and I'm, you know, I'm like a human being, I have feelings, I ache, I cry. Um, and then you set expectations. And like one of the biggest expectations in support is about estimation. And it needs to be, for me, it really needs to be explained upfront that es estimation is by definition what? Wrong. It's incorrect. Like it's to me, like estimation is trainable, like you can get better at it. And most PMs know after they've worked with any developer for any specific amount of time, like how much they need to multiply their estimate to get kind of the real time. You know, it might be 1.5, it might be three, it might be 0.5 sometimes. Um, but I think that's something that management needs to help train people and you can kind of go back and look at histories and see how things, uh, how things really ended up taking and kind of help with the process a little bit. But it always needs to be explained that it's an imperfect science the more we get to know your site, the better it'll be, but it's kind of inexact. Um, so let's talk about hiring and retention. Um, it's hard to find someone who is really super at Drupal and wants to do support. I said it. Um, it's also hard to find someone who has the soft skills to, to want to deal with an angry customer sometimes or to be able to explain things to someone who gets frustrated by technical jargon. And so um, find, generally my advice is to find someone who's really good at one thing and really willing to learn the other. Um, I think you can, you know, to a certain extent, you can kind of teach both. Um, you can at least help people get better, but only really if they're willing to, to make the effort. Um, and I think that uh, to help them get better at the technical side of it, uh, I think that's a good thing for bench time. I think that's a good thing for level one people to kind of see how level two, what kind of information they need and um, slowly sort of build their chops that way. And also I think that, um, you know, building tools like the site audit and things like that are great tools to help a level one person kind of get more familiar with, with, uh, with Drupal, with doing support and that kind of thing. The soft skills, so, um, one thing that I really recommend is verbal judo. Um, verbal judo is, like, has anyone ever heard of it? Yeah, verbal judo originally is what they teach the police to teach people to be persuasive without being violent. And you can hear, like, um, there's a great example. Like, we're doing good on time, so I want to tell this story because it was really amazing. So I'm in North Carolina, and I'm sitting outside at a Starbucks, and um, it's a pretty typical American scenario, right? So, um, so I'm sitting out at a Starbucks and I hear a policeman, like a plainclothes policeman get on the phone 
and he says, um, hey, uh, I'm looking for your son. And then obviously the son's not there. And he said, okay, well, this is kind of serious because there was a uh, child who, um, there was an incident of child molestation that was reported to us, the police, and there was a name given. And so we ran that name through our computers and two names came up and the, the child described the person as being about 250 pounds. And so the first person was, under, was way under that. So I don't think that we, you know, it's not him probably, but um, we see here that the records for your son says that he's about 195. So that's very different. So all I need to do is I need to go by there and just give him an eyeball, give him a quick look, just so I can check that box, just so I can show that I've done my job and we can just move on. And like, like you know what was really going on there, right? And I was like, verbal judo, that's what's going on. Like being able to say things in a way to get what you want. And so you won't have to deal with situations that seriously, like in Drupal development, hopefully. Um, there is like the dark Drupal underworld, which is another session at another con somewhere. Um, but, uh, you know, there are times when you are asking the client to do something that they don't want to do. You're asking the client to, a lot of times if they call and, some, and they're pissed, then the correct, you know, the normal response from me as a human is to respond in kind, you know, or maybe even level up a notch, you know, I'm a human being. If someone's insulting me or my company or threatening my financial security, I'm gonna, you know, wanna fight back. But it's amazing what, you, what happens, not if you, I'm so sorry, if you say, that is unbelievable, that is unacceptable, let me see what we can do right now to kind of resolve this problem. And you let them know that you understand without just giving sort of a, blanket apology for whatever, and you immediately go to get to the bottom of it. So verbal judo, you can see the, like this guy on YouTube, he's passed away, but you can also download the books on Kindle or whatever, and it's a good read, it's a quick read, and it gives, uh, it sort of helps to explain what soft skills are and how to use them effectively. The next thing that we developed at Pantheon is cakes. And so you won't find this in Google because I made it up, and so, CAKES stands for, um, for uh, uh, what does it stand for? Um, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> um, it stands for uh, completion, accuracy, execution, and empathy. And this is how we do ticket reviews. Just like you do code reviews, we do ticket reviews because we tried like sending level two tickets back to level one so they could see how it was fixed, um, and that didn't work so much. Um, but we do find that if level one has a problem with a ticket, they can tag it with for review. And then twice a week, my team gets together and they go over tickets that were solved or in progress and they review what happened and they talk about, you know, was I complete? Was I accurate? Um, did I execute the ticket workflow? Like, did I, el did I escalate it right? That sort of thing. And was I empathetic? Like, was I a jerk? Was I too short? Did I, did I not look at the problem enough? or was I responding fine, you know? And so it's amazing how well these things actually work because everyone, you know, it's a blameless sort of area, to, you know, way to get better at something. And then also using metrics, like you look at metrics, like to me, one of the most um, wall building metrics is utilization. You know, if at the end of the week you say, hey, um, you were only like 30% uh, billable, what's going on, you know? And it might be because he was solving a problem that was so hard that you had to write off hours or something like that. There's a lot of metrics you can use. Like one of the metrics that we use that's really valuable is what percent of tickets did first level resolve? Like we want that to get better. We want them to resolve, you know, most of the tickets. You know, it would be great if they could resolve all of them, but we know that's not gonna happen. But the more they can resolve on their own, it's sort of empowering and they wanna get better at it too, you know? Or we look at first response resolution. Like how, easy, how much were they able to like be like Batman and just wrap their wings around the problem and think of what it might be, do a bunch of quick debugging and come back with like, here's the issue, here's how you resolve it, you know, that kind of thing. Like using metrics as sort of an empowering tool is a good thing to do. Um, 
And then like for managers, I think one important consideration, this is like something you can probably Google. The, the, it's called the leader detractor scale. And so uh, the leader is someone who does what's expected, does something extra, mm -hmm. and helps someone. You know, like a real sort of overachiever kind of person. A, trip, a contributor, the level below that, someone who does what is, what's expected and something extra. And like those are the two groups that you really want to look for and nurture and hire because everything below that, you know, even someone who does only what's expected, sometimes in support isn't enough. Like if, if you say, hey, check this out, it might be a cron issue, then you'll get a ticket back saying it wasn't a cron issue. You know, the customer is still suffering, um, but they've done exactly what you asked them or what they thought you wanted. So it's kind of a, you know, a back and forth kind of thing, but you really want to look for people who can sort of, you know, really empathize with the issue. So um, that's, that was a really bad animated GIF. Um, I think that's uh, kind of all I wanted to talk about. Um, I hope you liked it. And if you have any questions, let's, uh, let's talk. So, thank you, Nick. <laughs> um, so email bravery was, uh, email bravery is when, when you send an email, it's also, you can see it in various parts of the internet where people are willing to say something that they would not say to someone's face via email. And to me, the best way to combat email bravery, and I, am, I have done it, so I'm not, you know, I'm saying sometimes customers get mad they type emotionally, and that's not good for a support department to be on the receiving end of that. So here's how you fight it. My favorite image is like someone typing it and sending it and like take that, and then they look at their phone and their phone rings. Like that's how you combat email bravery. Like as soon as you receive that email, pick up the phone and call and directly say, hey, it sounds like you're upset. You know, or hey, we screwed up. And you, you know, it's amazing how quickly you can turn it around. Sir. I think your mic's not on. Yeah. Um, okay. So ticketing system. That's a real. That's a great question. And um, so in the IT managed services world, there's a couple really good products. Like the cream of the crop is like a Siebel system that handles all that, and it also handles like agreements and block hours and all that it's SLAs, that sort of thing. Um, the next step down that I used at my managed services company is don't write this down because I'm going to tell you why you're not going to buy it in a minute. Um, is a company called Connectwise. And ConnectWise also handles block hour agreements, all that stuff. It handles it as a customer portal. It does all that stuff. You're not going to buy it because one, there's like a $12,000 initial fee to just get it set up. The number two reason you may not buy it is it because it requires a .NET application to be installed on your computer, um, which, you know, ruled it out for when I pitched it to the Drupal shop. Um, so we. We at Pantheon use Desk, which is a Salesforce, comp Salesforce product. Um, it's not perfect, but it works. Um, I think the main, the, the, thing, the, the thing that you need to consider is you really want to get something that does billing. And we ended up using a product called, <laughs> this, is a, this doesn't have a very happy ending, by the way. Um, I found a product called Blue Folder, which became Packet Trap as they went down the poor naming ladder that became Packet Trap. And I was actually gonna bring it up here, but I went to the site and they were bought by Dell, which everyone was excited about, which click quickly killed the product altogether. So um, now my recommendation would be, Desk works okay, it doesn't handle like billing, and which can suck up a lot of time. Um, consider something like Desk or Zendesk or Freshdesk plus maybe something like Harvest 
um, that can handle the time entry and billing and that sort of stuff. Another consideration is any of those most likely have a way to write something, um, you know, you could set up another database like an agreement kind of thing that um, takes billable time and will debit down the hours. So I wish that there, maybe there is a better product out there. I couldn't find one or else I would have talked about it here. Uh, so we have people using Pantheon in Europe. We do not have a, a Euro data center. I should have started with that. That seems to be a common question. We didn't, we didn't know you liked this. No, we have people using it in Europe. We have a lot of people using it in Europe, Australia, especially in conjunction with a CDN. But, um, but yeah, we, we will eventually. We want to. We like it here. Sorry, sir, I wasn't paying attention. What does the X stand for in cakes? Ah, execution. Thank you. I sort of had to, you know. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? So, um, 546. So, an agile approach to support doesn't always work. Sometimes it does. It works when, uh, for me, it works best when it's that initial, you've onboarded someone and there's a bunch of problems, you know, or when there's a laundry list. You know, if you have a client that has like, I need these 10 things that need to get done. Like after you've gone through that, that lends itself to like an agile kind of thing. Again, that's really hard to estimate because usually it's your first look at a site when you're handling that. So it's really important to stress that Estimation is going to be way off base. Okay. So if there's no more questions, thanks a lot, and it's uh, awesome being here. Uh, we're, we'll be around. Oh, uh, uh, Wonderkraut is doing a similar support-related thing tomorrow at 1045, and then there's going to be a boff right after that at around 12-ish. So if you want to talk more about support, um, there are a cool bunch of dudes, and we'll all hang out together and talk about support. <laughs>